Hello, and welcome to devlog number 29. This one's going to focus almost entirely on conquest because it's what people want to hear about, and it's what I've been basically entirely focused on for the last couple months. This will also be the first real look at conquest since I did that prototype preview at the end of October in devlog 26. What I showed back in October was basically a back of the envelope prototype, and everything that I showed has been completely redone using the lessons learned from that. So everything that I'm going to show here today is entirely newly implemented. And trust me when I say that there have been a lot of lessons learned, not just in that prototype from October, but in implementing the game itself over the last couple of years, there's been so much I've learned about how to architect this thing and how to use Mirror properly and how to do networking right. And I've tried to carry as many of those lessons as I could into the actual implementation of Conquest. I'm sure it's not hard for many people to believe that this is the first game that we've done, and so a lot of things were done in less than optimal ways or maybe not the best, smartest way of doing it. The skirmish game itself is, while relatively bug-free, notoriously rickety and unstable for some people on certain internet connections. It was also implemented in a way that will make it so that it's never going to be possible for someone to join a skirmish game late, which is unfortunate and is a side effect of how I implemented it, but it is just it would require a complete rewrite of the skirmish game in order to make that possible. The reason for that is that the skirmish game downloads everything to all the clients, builds it up independently, and then does its best to keep everything in sync, and it does it reasonably well but syncing that post start of the game state to newly joining clients just isn't possible. So of course, due to the drop in drop out requirement for conquest, I had to make sure that it's being done correctly in a networking sense from the start. And I've put a lot of time over the last couple of months into making sure that it's gonna be done that way. Now, before I get into actually showing off the new conquest stuff, I wanna talk a little bit about the design process for those of you who are interested in that. The first step is obviously the easiest, thinking about what I want to be in the update, how the different mechanics are going to interact, what is most important versus what's nice to have. I'll do that usually when I'm going for a run or something, but then it's time to sit down and write what I call the concept document. And that's basically just a really loose and informal game design document, and I release them for all the major updates. If you haven't read the Conquest one yet, I'll leave a link for that in the description so that you can go check it out and see everything that's planned to be coming in the major update. Once that's done and I'm happy with it, it's time to go through it and make it actually actionable. So I'll go through and I'll annotate it like the version you're seeing on the screen where I'll highlight all of the things that indicate actual features and give them a reference number. This makes sure that everything that I wrote in the conquest document that could be construed as a feature is actually accounted for in the task list. From there, I go through all of those features and I turn them into a list of actual tasks that need to be completed. Because I'm a monster, I use a spreadsheet for this so I can see all of the real-life project managers getting red in the face just looking at this. This is a little more complicated than just taking the list of features from the concept document because it also requires me to think about what are the subtasks that are required for each of these major features and then building the task list out of that. I break the development of major updates down into phases, which are basically milestones that reflect a large, contiguous portion of the update that's been completed. Usually there's a foundation phase at the beginning, so for Conquest, that's things like the database, the desktop windowing system, um, the persistent game server, all that kind of stuff. Conquest has seven phases total, and the stuff you're going to see in the rest of the devlog is from phase zero, the foundation, phase one, the strategic map, and phase two, the start, about 50% of what's been implemented for the basic playable game. So without further ado, let's get to what you're all actually here to see. This is going to be divided into two parts, the first of which is how to set up a new game, and the second I'll walk through some gameplay mechanics in a handwritten save game file because the new game creation and the actual game playing are not connected yet. Originally I had planned to have a system similar to the skirmish lobby where players would join the host as they're starting the new game, they'd get to see them pick the map and the scenario and define the rule set, but that was just a lot of additional complexity that wasn't really necessary. So instead I went with this system where the host is going to choose their map scenario and game rules and start the game that people can connect to, and then as players connect they'll get thrown into this middle bucket here. From there you'll be able to choose which team you want to join by clicking one of these buttons, and then we also have this other player that's just a database entry I added so that I could test player manipulation commands. Joining teams at the start of the game, you can just flip-flop back and forth between any team that you want, but once the host clicks this approve teams button they become locked. And the reason for that is that once the faction design begins, there's a lot of possibility for intelligence leaks. So you could go over to Team Atlas, see what their faction traits are, what their Navy design looks like, and then flip back over to Team Boxer. And that just would not really be a cool thing to do. So I've approved the teams early here just to show you so that when I try to join a team, it'll tell me, are you sure you want to join this team? Because you're not going to be able to change once you do. Once I've joined a team, I can flip through these other tabs and see what the design of the faction looks like. But you'll notice that I can't actually act on anything. And the reason for that is that I'm not the team captain or the high admiral, so I'll appoint myself, since I'm the server admin, I can appoint myself as the high admiral for this team, and then I can actually change all of these things. 
Now, the High Admiral automatically has all permissions, but I could designate myself a naval architect, or I could do it for one of my teammates, or any of my teammates who I want to help with the navy design, because I might not want to set up the whole faction myself, or maybe someone has the templates we want to use. So let's go ahead and set up our faction's identity here on this tab, so we'll be the Awesome Alliance. And we can also select the base faction that we based on, that will define which hulls and equipment that we have available. We'll choose a badge, we'll choose our base color and our prefix. And then when we flip back over to the membership tab, we can see that our colors and our badge and our base faction have all, and our team name have all been copied over to here so that people can know what they're gonna join. Over on the right here, we've got these trait cards, and those are things that are mentioned in the concept document, which allow us to basically take the base faction that we've got, so Shelter Alliance in this case, and then add additional things on top of it that allow us to customize it. So things that'll give modifiers for like more fleet points or reduce the amount of ships that are in maintenance in the start of the game, just to give our team our own individual flavor for how we wanna play. These are not implemented yet. They're gonna come in a later phase. Flipping over to the Navy Design tab, this is where we're going to pick all of the initial ship designs that we're going to use, and we have a list of all of the available hulls for the base faction that we've selected here. We can either create a design that's completely new, which doesn't currently work, but you'll eventually be able to open the fleet editor from here, or we can use an existing template. So we'll create this gun frigate, and we'll choose the number of uh, instances that we want to create at the start of the game. And as we increase the count, you can see the total point cost of our starting Navy going up over on the left. And now we'll add a beam destroyer as well. And you can see that we have an increased amount of cost for the second design. And the reason for this is so that you can't just add every possible design that you could want at the start of the game and save yourself on having to do blueprint research, which we'll talk about in a future devlog, or you can just read the concept document. But basically, now that we've added this light cruiser, we have 3000 total points of our Navy are spent on just designs. And then adding the heavy cruiser, it's gonna be even more because it goes up in an arithmetic increase. And this is for all designs total, so you'll notice that we have five ship designs and one missile design. That missile design was added automatically because one of the ship designs that we added used the Thunderhead missiles, and so those are going to be pre-researched for us. Now we'll go ahead and add this other gun frigate version, which has a VLS module and also has Thunderhead missiles on it, and just start adding other ships that we're going to want, total counts for the different classes for our starting navy. And then if we keep increasing the amount of light cruisers that we have, you can see that we go over our available point cost and so it gets highlighted in red. So let's just lower that back down to 30. Now, if I'm a high admiral or a naval architect, I can change the designs, I can edit them, I can rename them or I can delete them, but anyone on the team can just click on the design to view its details and that bottom portion we've filled in eventually. But I can see the mounts on there, I can see everything that's, the ship's been designed to do. And so as a normal team member, I can still contribute to the faction's design by giving ideas in chat, chatting with my teammates, even if I don't have the permissions to do the editing myself. That'll cover new game creation for now. So let's flip over to the handmade save file that I talked about earlier. This map will mostly look familiar if you watch Devlog 26 back in October, but there's also some new stuff that you're going to notice right off the bat. The first thing you'll probably notice immediately is that the scale of the orbits of the moons has been artificially increased. The reason for this is that one of the things I found most problematic about the prototype version was that it was really hard to read the status of the solar system at any kind of um, large zoom. The simulation of travel times and things like that is still done at a true scale, but when it comes to the visuals, I think that makes the map much more visually appealing and much more readable. And unlike the tactical game, being able to determine true distances at a glance isn't really important at the strategic level. I also improved the zooming in on the mouse cursor a lot and added these large colored sphere of influences around the different celestial bodies so that it's easy to see at a glance who controls what portions of space. And then areas of space that per the scenario are not defined as capturable don't have those, but if they were capturable and were not captured, they'd have a gray circle around them. Yes, the UI looks very prototype. It's mostly so that I can just do UI layouts and then program functionality without having to worry about visual design. Although I actually kind of like the way it looks. It's very brutalist the way the rest of the UI is and no one really plays Neb for its attractive UI, that's for sure. For the main UI itself, we've got this status bar up at the top with all of our commands and then the uh, taskbar at the bottom for the desktop windows we'll talk about in a little bit. We also have a series of overlays. Eventually these will toggle uh, the overlay type and it'll show different things on the system map depending on the mode that you're in and those modes will be accessible based on what roles you have. The top bar also shows the status of all of our resources. So these are our production resources. We've got common, rare, metals, polymers, and then machine parts. And then over here is our logistics supplies. Those are fuel, food, and ammunition. 
you'll be able to click on each of these and break them down a little more into the different types, specifically for ammunition, what types of ammo we have and where they're located. And then you'll be able to do the same thing for production resources, showing where they are. And then this button eventually will open up a filter that'll show you help you define how you want to view your resources, whether you always see the global numbers, whether you see them based on where your camera is currently looking. So if you're zoomed in on this gas giant, for example, you'll only see resources present in this subsystem. And then in the center here, we've got our current turn and that phase of the turn, so the tasking phase where we issue orders. We've got the date, and no, before anyone asks, this is not like a canon date that reflects anything. It's just something that I chose. We've got our two teams and the war progress between them. Eventually, be able to click on this and see all the different contributing factors for what's driving the war progress. So, you know, how many ships you've lost and what planets you control and how that's working against or for you. We've got two pull downs in the top left, the first of which is the system hierarchy. Uh, this shows you all of the celestial objects in the system and how they relate to each other. It shows you who controls them in a nice color display. You can expand and contract them. You can double click on them to zoom to it if you want. Eventually, space stations and other orbital infrastructure will be included on here, but that's not currently defined yet. And that's probably a good time to talk about what actually defines a conquest game. So there's going to be three parts to that. The first layer is what you're seeing here, and that's the system itself. So all of the stars, celestial bodies, gates, minor objects like asteroids, that kind of stuff. And that part is mostly done, as much as it can be done at this phase of development. The layer above that is going to be the infrastructure layer. So that's going to be a set of definitions that say there's a space station in orbit over this planet, and it has these capabilities, these types of berths. It has this kind of supply, whatever facility on it. That's also going to define the properties of planets, so how many cities there are, what their populations are, what their surface-to-orbit defenses might look like, that kind of stuff. And that has not been started yet. And then the third, final, highest layer is going to be your actual scenario itself. And that scenario is going to define things like which team controls what bodies at the start, what is and isn't capturable, what the objectives are. And the reason I'm doing it in this fashion is so that if you want to write your own scenario in the Akota system, you don't need to basically worry about where all the space stations are, what the resources are, because you can use my infrastructure layer that's going to ship with the update. Or you can still use the Akota system and you can make the layout of the system completely different if you want for your own custom scenario. Now let's talk about the desktop system. This was one of the foundational elements I worked on first, so we'll view the information for this star first. So it brings up this window that we can drag around, we can resize it, we can minimize it, we can see that it's um, down in the taskbar as well for when we minimize it, we can maximize it back through there. And the reason I decided to opt for this desktop style environment is that there's going to be a lot of information you're going to need to worry about in Conquest. And so having these windows that you can drag around, that you can see lots of information at the same time and compare side by side, is going to make things a lot easier than having to just flip through all these different menus that take up the whole screen. You might also have noticed that loading bar that came up when I opened each of these windows. And there's an artificial delay right now for testing, because obviously this data can be retrieved immediately because I am the host. But that loading bar is part of the lazy synchronization system that I developed as another foundational component in the first phase. Part of making Conquest able to support drop-in, drop-out joining means I have to make everything synchronized through Mirror's synchronization properties. But there's a lot of very bulky data, such as images or blueprints for ships, that doesn't need to be transferred as soon as someone joins. And so I created this lazy sync system where instead of having to do a bespoke message every time I want to get some type of data, I created a foundational system where I can just use it wherever. I do this lazy sync object and then a data type, and anytime I need to get it, I just request it, and the system gives me a promise saying, I will resolve this data for you at some time in the future. And while that promise is unresolved, you'll see that loading bar, and then as the data comes in, it'll all get populated in the window. So I can open up the uh, information for one of these ships, and you'll see that there's a couple pieces of data that come in. That's things like the status of all the modules on the ship and what the ship's fitting actually looks like, because there's no reason for me to have to download that for every single ship right when I join the server. I implemented two different versions of this. One is just lazy sync object that allows me to synchronize an individual thing like an image. And then there's also a lazy sync list that allows me to have header data. So for example, a ship blueprint that has its name, point cost, hull type, etc., and then a large piece of bulk data that gets lazily downloaded only when I need it, that is the actual full fitting of the ship. All right, so let's zoom in on Jules Rest here, which is where most of the action in the system is happening. I've got a bunch of friendly and enemy forces around, and I can view all of them by using the other pull down, which is the tax set. And then I can click on certain things to turn them off. I can filter out what I don't want to see. 
but this list is going to show me all of my friendly units as well as all of the other units that I'm tracking throughout the system. So over here by Sapphire, I've got these three tracks, two of which I've identified as hostile or suspect, and then one that I haven't evaluated yet. Evaluating these tracks is going to be something that your team's intel officers are going to be responsible for based on their knowledge of game mechanics and meta knowledge of the actual state of the game. Whenever something new pops up, it's going to be an unevaluated track, so I can go ahead and I can edit this. And let's say that through various means, I know that this is actually a civilian ship. It's neutral, it's a cargo ship, so I'll label it as cargo. And now that updates the track for everyone on my team to see. Furthermore, let's say that I know that this is no longer suspect, that it is actually definitely a hostile ship, so I'll just change that label there. For friendly units, I can take multiple ships and I can group them together, so this will automatically form TG Dogwood. It just picks a random name, and you're going to see that name change a couple times as I'm going through this. I find things wrong and I have to restart the client, but that's just reality when you're showing off something this early. So let's say I want to take TG Linden somewhere, and I don't know how long it's going to take to get there. I also don't want to start issuing an order in order to do that, so I can use this measuring tool to figure it out. The measuring tool was actually not part of the original feature set, but it was something I implemented pretty quickly just to, as an easy way to validate my numbers to make sure the scales worked out and the math was correct, and it turned out to be super useful, so it's just staying in the game now. The measuring unit that you're seeing here is MSKs or Mega Statute Kilometers. Basically, it's millions of kilometers. I chose that unit because it's a little more intuitive to me than AUs because the numbers tend to tick up a lot faster. There's a lot more granularity there. Also, AU doesn't really make sense in a non-Earth-centric system. The abbreviation itself is actually a throwback to a really old sci-fi television show from the 90s that if you know, then you know. So I can take this measuring tool over to Topaz and I can see that it'll tell me that my travel time at max burn and max deceleration is one day 12 hours. And I can see where that body is going to be at arrival with the red line and the red circle. So I can drag this tool around, see distances and travel times to different bodies. I can also measure all the way across the system and you'll notice that as my cursor leaves the sphere of influence of this planet, the number jumps up substantially because while you're inside one of these spheres, the uh, measurement is actually scaled based on the artificial inflation of those orbits. So I know I want to take TG Linden over to Topaz. So let's start a movement order by having the unit selected and then right clicking on the planet and going to this move to drop down. When I click this, it's going to open up something that looks very intimidating, but I promise you it's a lot simpler than it looks and it's got a lot of utility behind it. Let's start the movement order and that will open up the order writer. At the top, we've just got some naval message flavor and then we've got two primary sections, the first of which is our execution timing and the second of which is the actual order itself. So anything that's highlighted in orange is the critical stuff you need to read and anything that's orange and underlined and highlights means that you can actually change it. So over here in execution timing, Immediately upon receipt means that as soon as the turn executes, they're going to do it. We can drag this around up until 30 minutes before the end of the turn, um, and we can choose any time in between, but I just want this to happen immediately. Then down here, we can see that we're going to go from Jules Rest to Topaz. This tells us our travel time of one day, 12 hours, and then it also tells us what our arrival time is, so we don't need to calculate that ourselves. Before we talk about that last section at the bottom of the movement order, let's talk about supplements a little bit. One of the powers of this order writing system is that we can add supplements to the end of the orders to add additional behavior to the units. So let's say that we know that this unit is low on food and we're not going to be able to resupply it. So we can add a rationing section to the order and uh, crews by default are going to eat three meals a day per crew member. But we can change that using this supplement to save ourselves on food. It will affect morale, which will have an effect later, but we can basically prevent the crew from starving if they're going to be on a long journey that we can't resupply. I decided to implement orders this way for a couple reasons. The first is that it just adds a lot of atmosphere and realism to the game because this is how orders are issued at the strategic level. The second is that turns can be very long depending on the game settings. Seven days is the standard one that's in the concept document. A system with this degree of pre-planning allows you to set those units on rails and trust that what you set them to do is what they're going to execute over those next seven days. And finally, and most interestingly, these orders will be interceptable by the enemy based on unit positions and random chance for decryption, and the enemy could get copies of random orders sent to random units and be able to determine your intent based on those. All right, let's scoot this window over and start talking about trajectory planning. By clicking on this bottom portion of the movement order, we can actually open up the trajectory planner, and that will show us 
basically our burn times, distance, fuel consumption, etc., as well as drawing a line on the map showing us the portion of our trajectory that is accelerating versus decelerating. By clicking and dragging on this bar here, we can actually change our target top speed and our burn time, how much time we're spending accelerating versus decelerating, and that's also reflected on the map. Yes, I am aware that reducing our acceleration would result in the trajectory not being a straight line like this, but rather curving around to meet the target. And no, I don't care about that, because I've said many times that all of the units at the strategic level are going to follow a straight line trajectory because I'm not doing a patched conics implementation for this, because there's no reason to. This is not an orbital mechanics simulator, it's not Kerbal Space Program, there are plenty of games that do it way better than I ever could. The orbital mechanics that are integrated into the game are only there to create interesting terrain and cause interesting strategic decisions. On another realism note, after playing a little bit with radar ranges at the strategic level, which is the yellow circles that you see, I'm leaning right now towards the primary means of tracking ships across the solar system being by their drive flare. That creates another interesting reason for you to change your burn time so that you limit the detectability of your ship so that the enemy can only see you when you're burning towards them, such as when you're decelerating towards an enemy held planet. Yes, I am also aware that the drive flare would be visible from the front of the ship, but stealth and counter detection are so integral to Nebulus's mechanics, and stealth and counter detection are also a huge part of real world military operations that it would seem like such a missed opportunity to not include a mechanic like that here. Another reason to slow your ships down aside from fuel consumption and detectability is making it easier for your own units to rendezvous with them. So here we have TG Linden flying across the system, and I want to have Sycamore join up and meet them before they arrive at their destination. If I had planned this trajectory to be max burn, max deceleration, then there's no way they could ever catch up. But before I planned this order, I had slowed them down substantially, so they're already at their top speed. So I can start this rendezvous order and we can see how much of the trajectory is acceleration versus matching velocity, and you can see how far away they actually end up meeting the target. Now, let's say that another fleet commander on my team wants to change the trajectory of TG Linden. So they want to route it over to this planet here. So you'll see this new portion of the trajectory that's the course change time, basically killing excess velocity, and then burning down towards the planet. Now, when I go to apply this order, I'll be warned that there is another unit that's dependent on my current orders and that if I apply these orders, it's going to invalidate those other orders, and I can see in the taxit list that those orders are now invalid. The reason for that is not so much that the game can't just recompute the trajectory for you for the rendezvous, it's that the conditions that were present when you issued those orders initially are no longer there, and things might end up happening the way you didn't expect them to happen. So I said I wanted Sycamore to meet up with Linden en route, but if the new trajectory makes it so that the rendezvous will always happen after they arrive at that enemy planet, then there's no point in doing that rendezvous. So basically, this is protecting you from yourself, making sure that everything is going to happen the way you expect it to happen, and you'll have to reissue any invalid orders before you can actually advance your turn. All right, that was a lot of stuff. Before we go, I want to close out this devlog by talking a little bit about the roadmap. We laid out the game's early access roadmap a long time ago, back in pre-alpha, I think in 2020, if I remember correctly. And we've obviously learned a lot since then, both about game development and about our own capabilities. And so I wanna provide some updates to the roadmap here going forward. So first, Marines and boarding. I've been trying to do a lot of back of the envelope design for this, trying to figure out how we can integrate it into the game. And I just wasn't coming up with anything. I can't really think of a way that this could fit into the game that isn't gonna be either a complete useless joke or so overpowered that you absolutely have to take it. Like for example, airships conquer the skies. So Marines and boarding is going to be cut. We will not be doing that as a major update. Next, environmental hazards. I don't know why I originally put this on the roadmap as a major update. Now that I've seen the amount of work and content that has gone into our previous major updates, it just doesn't fit the bill for a major update. So that's going to get rolled into Conquest as a way to make Abyssal Battles more interesting because there will probably be a lot more Abyssal Battles in Conquest than you're used to. So that'll include things like local sensor interference that's not due to jammers, gas clouds, that kind of stuff. When it comes to carriers, you can let out a sigh of relief. Carriers will go ahead as planned. That will be our major update after Conquest. And finally, single player campaign. I think all of us here on the team had this idea in our head of a homeworld-like single player campaign where you've got a bunch of named missions strung together that you have the same fleet that goes through. I think a lot of players inferred the same thing based on the layout of the mission select for the tutorials, for example. And I think that we just need to be honest with ourselves that we don't have the experience or capability or resources to make a storyline campaign like that that features cutscenes and, and all that really high quality stuff. I also don't think that it actually fits with the mechanics of the game as they are now. I feel like it would be far too easy to get soft locked in that campaign if you're stuck with just the same fleet the whole time. 
It also raises a lot of design considerations, such as it's really hard to have a hero ship in Nebulous because everything is just so damn fragile. So if we designed all the missions expecting the player to hold their flagship back and preserve it, then we balanced the enemy's combat power expecting that if they did use their flagship, they'd just steamroll the enemy, or vice versa, if we expected them to always use their flagship, then if they were playing it safe and holding it back, then they would get steamrolled by the AI every time. But we have all this really great world building and this interesting conflict that we want to tell that players are invested in, so what we're going to do for the storyline campaign instead is we're going to make it a conquest scenario. Along with the carrier's update, we'll be releasing the Bethel Star system and a scenario that reflects the Bethel Rebellion. I think that this will integrate a lot better with the game mechanics. It'll also take more advantage of all this work that we're already doing for Conquest. And it also has some additional benefits in that it'll allow you to play both sides of the conflict, which we were not going to be able to do in a mission-based storyline. It was going to be Alliance only. And you'll be able to play through it with your friends. Since it's just Conquest, you'll be able to play multiplayer. I know that some people are going to be disappointed by this news, but if there's anything that I learned in my naval career, it's that leadership means that you have to make these tough decisions sometimes. We have to look to our strengths as a team and as a game, and our strength is in a detailed, realistic combat sandbox. And we can still tell an interesting story by playing to the strengths of our team and of our game. So to sum up, the rest of our early access period will look like this. We're going to finish conquests that we're currently working on and that you just saw. Based on the current time that it's taken to get as far as we are in the task list, I'm going to say very conservatively, and this is not a hard date, but the end of 2024 is looking like a reasonable time frame that this can be expected. After Conquest is released, we'll go to the Carriers update, which I'm estimating based on the previous major updates, that'll take about six months to develop. Along with that Carriers update, we'll release the Bethel Star system and the Bethel Rebellion Conquest scenario. And then that will be our 1.0 release, and Nebulous will leave early access and go into full release on Steam. And with that, that about covers everything that I wanted to talk about in this devlog. I hope you really enjoyed this first in-depth look at Conquest, and I hope you're looking forward to the update as much as I am. Thanks for watching.